Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. Welcome into the next edition of The Grittiest Take, as I'm joined by a very special guest, Rachel Miriam, who's on the great Locked On Flyers. We had Russ Cohen on a couple weeks ago. Check out their podcast. They do some great stuff on the draft, the offseason, the season in general, and pretty much anything that relates to the Philadelphia Flyers, plus the cool crossover episodes with Blackhawks, all the different Locked On. So there's a bunch of different cool features involved in the Locked On podcast. But first and foremost, before we go into the team, how are you doing today, Rachel? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Good. It's a nice day. I got to go for a long walk um, this morning because it's a, well, this morning it was nice. It's supposed to get hot later, but this morning it was still nice and cool out. So I got to go for a nice walk through like Lafayette Hill, Contra Hawkins. So it's been a pretty good day when you're able to do that. Um, And either way, whenever we do these types of podcasts, I'm always, even if it's raining outside, you're always doing good because it's fun to talk about. Even when the Flyers aren't necessarily doing good, it's still fun to talk about the Flyers. Absolutely. But I think the first thing we should get to, I know I've kind of already heard your thoughts from listening to the podcast, but when it comes to Tortorella, if you... Would you have chosen him as the head coach? And what are your thoughts on him as the head coach? Yeah, I think that it was a really interesting choice because to me, I'm always about being realistic, right? And living in the reality of the Flyers world that we are currently in, right? And so if you are in the camp of people that say, we should tear it all down, do a rebuild. Chuck Fletcher should be fired. Dave Scott doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to hockey. If like that is your thought and feeling, that is 100% valid. I don't think John Tortorella is the right hire in that scenario where you're doing a full rebuild and you want somebody that can work with the younger players a little bit better. Maybe you want someone that is going to want to build a legacy and start from scratch along with the team and basically say we're all in it together right i don't think that's john tortorella at all but if you're in the the world that the flyers are right now where chuck fletcher says we're going to be aggressive this offseason we are going to try and take a step forward and challenge for a playoff position i don't think he's suggested that they will make the playoffs i think he's just saying we want a challenge for one I think that John Tortorella is the right hire. I think he's the right kind of coach for that because he's a dynamic guy who's going to demand excellence and accountability. And that's the thing that this current group of players has been lacking the most, right? So I, I think that it's a he's a really good hire in the circumstances that Chuck Fletcher has laid out for us. Yeah, I agree with that. I think in the circumstances, the team itself has laid out he's perfect and i also think from what he said um in the one interview he did how he likes just letting guys kind of work their way in by who they are but also implementing his strategies and system into them where i think with the flyers that'll really help him because there's a lot of guys that kind of have to be pinpointed in a certain direction in order to be the best version of themselves. Like, I would say one example is probably Travis Konechny. Because Travis Konechny, yes, he did score the most points on the team last year. But I could point out about 75,000 defensive mistakes that Travis Konechny made. So, like, in order to play with John Tortorella, you have to balance both. Otherwise, you're going to end up in a PLD situation or whatever where he's like, well, you're much better than this. Why aren't you doing? And that's why I think, from that aspect, I really like the Tortorella hire because he's going to make guys better than they really, perception-wise at least, are in some mm-hmm. aspects, where that's what he even admitted to doing in Columbus. He said, we needed more skill, but at least we came to the ring knowing we were one of the hardest teams to play against each night, and we were one of the teams that was going to make it hard on the other side. And I think that's the first key the Flyers need to building this back up because they seem to kind of have lost their culture ever since, rest in peace, the great Ed Schneider kind of passed away. They seem to lose that vibe of we're always going to make sure we're the best version we can be where I think that was more, not because Dave Scott's terrible at his job. I think it was more, he didn't know what the hell he was doing until he figured it out now because he never ran a hockey team and Comcast kind of just 
threw him into the fire and said, okay, cool, you're running the Flyers now. So I think over time he's kind of started to figure it out, but there's probably still a four- or five-year process until he's really figured it out. Because, like, him coming down at the press conference, even though he wasn't good at that press conference, at least he was there. So it's like he's starting to be more visible. He's starting to – he sent out the survey when you wouldn't think anybody in their right mind would send out a fan survey after this year. So, like, there's different things he's done to more so ingratiate the fan base, but I think he's still – Kind of like how Jeffrey Lurie was a few years ago with the Eagles. At that point, oh, with him realized, like buying cheesesteaks for everybody. Yeah, yeah, like like he's kind of one of those guys. that's like Lurie first started the opposite of Scott. He started too friendly, and then people were like this is weird for an owner to be like at tailgates. Where Scott's the opposite, but he has to realize that you don't want to go to the extreme of Jeffrey Lurie, but you want to be like Lurie now, where he's like, okay, cool, I trust. Like he, how he took the hands off on Howie Roseman and stuff where I don't know. I don't think Chuck Fletcher might be the right GM to take the hands off on. But like once you do that, I think that's the thing you have to do where this is kind of the make or break year, I would say, for Chuck Fletcher. If he's actually the right GM to say, let's take the hands off and let him run the ship. That's going to depend. I think this is his last year to kind of make or break the team. Otherwise, it'll probably be gone well, at most. I don't know. I have my doubts about that. I, I think he has to prove a lot, but at the same time, I think that Dave Scott really likes him and is going to give him a long leash. And that's like, whether you like it or not, or whether you think that's appropriate or not, I think that's the reality that we're living in. That is actually a good point because it does seem like Scott, like at this point, most other teams, I think would have let go of Chuck Fletcher, especially when you have, like, I know he's been with Fletcher's entire career, but if Brent is willing to be a GM, you have two guys that love scouting. You have two guys that love every level of hockey and Briere and Flair. So it would have made perfect sense for both of them to work together, which they already are doing. But I mean, like, more perception-wise working together because Danny Breer has the Dwight Schrute role of assistant, whatever it is, assistant to the general manager. So he's not even the assistant general manager. He's an assistant. So it's like, it's a weird role they created to bring Danny in. So it seems like they're kind of moving him up the ladder over time, but not really showing that perception wise. So that's like, that's the weird disconnect I kind of have with the organization. What I appreciated, as we can turn to the press conference now, the bluntness that Fletcher and Flair had. Mm -hmm. It's more I didn't agree with everything, but I did appreciate the bluntness. And that's kind of what I want to see going forward, because the fan base said, just be truthful with us. I don't care if I agree with everything you say. I can bluntly 100 percent disagree. But if you tell me exactly what you want, at least I know where you're coming from. Where Fletcher even said six, five guy with speed. So at that point, all you got to do is look at everybody that's six, five with speed or six, four, because obviously they're not just saying six, like in the range with speed. And you're probably going to draft those guys and focus on those guys. So it's like you're a check, um, mm -hmm. like Gauthier, if somehow you're able to trade up for Slavkovsky. So there's like different guys that fit into that realm. So I think he defined this year better than other years and what they actually want. Now it's just more, is he going to accomplish what they want? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that presser was, uh, I think, what we are now learning is kind of vintage Chuck Fletcher, where he is just a very serious guy with very serious, uh, you know, thoughts and approaches to things. And he kind of talks his way around what he, he can't say because it's pre-draft and he can't play his hand too much. But you can kind of read between the lines there, right? Yeah, no, I agree, and I think Brent is the guy because he picked up even interrupting uh, Chuck a couple times to pick up the yeah. question that Chuck was answering. Like, I think Brent's the guy that is more forthright, but at the same time, when the one question was asked, he said he's not going to give that give forward that information. I think most people that watch the podcast know who asked that question. I'm not going to say it on the podcast. It's not worth it. But the like when that question is like i'm not going to give away dirt so like they did know when not to talk about something but fletcher i just liked how he gave forward like 
in most past press conferences, you walked out of it going, I don't really know what they want in the draft. I kind of know what they want in the draft. Where at least in this year, they like Fletcher was specific and Brent laughed because he didn't know if he'd probably be able to get that guy at five. But he said like a six, five ish guy with speed. So, like, if you're able to get that, that's why I don't think we're going to pick Nemec, in my own opinion, because Nemec doesn't have any speed. The one thing Simon I mean, Nemec isn't great at is skating at this point. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's a guy they're really looking at. Yeah, I think that speed is something that the Flyers have been lacking. I mean, they're very clearly slow, and so even if the Flyers are going to go for a defenseman in this draft and not think goal scoring, which I think could be a mistake on it, honestly, I think you really truly go best available in this situation because you're not looking for somebody that's going to help you right away at number five. I I think that in the defenseman sphere, I think Juracek is a better fit for the Flyers and what they seem to want to do than Nemec is. And so between those two, absolutely. I just don't, I don't think that Nemec is going to be there at, at five anyway. So I think that Yurichek is more likely. And I think the most likely option, presuming that nobody ahead of us picks him. Yeah, yeah, I would think he's the most likely option other than, I would say, Gauthier because he's a bigger guy that's continued to progress his skating time after time each season. So I feel like, them looking at that, thinking that's going to continue to trend up is going to make them confident going, well, we could draft him because he's already at least even with kind of where Scotty is at skating right now, where Scotty Lawton really had to work on skating, where he now has to work from the level that Lawton's at now. So it's like, I think they're going to believe he can become a better skater, but I feel like he's still a risk because it's still that question where if you pick you're a check. You already know he's at that level of skating. Or if Savoy falls, yeah, he's not the bigger guy that the organization has been talking about drafting. But it's interesting you, you bring up Scott Lawton because uh, going back to our earlier conversation about John Tortorella, I think Lawton is somebody that's going to thrive under John Tortorella because Lawton has been the Swiss Army knife a little bit over the last couple of years and just kind of doing what he's asked. I think that's exactly the kind of attitude that's going to create a successful environment for him with Tortorella. And if he just pushes himself that little bit further and gets his skating just a a hair faster, I think the scoring could pick up. I think his playmaking ability could pick up and you'd get like, you know, five to 10 more goals out of him next year. Yeah, that would be really nice. The guy I, Lorden, Lord, yeah, Lord definitely makes sense uh, to me to be a guy that will fit perfectly because he's the defense first that then brings the offense and is good in the face-off dot. So John Tortorella basically has a man crush on every single person that fits into that category. So I think he's definitely going to fit in right away. A guy that I think is going to definitely make the team this year where I think it was still like he played very great in the 13 or 14 games he played. But I think Noah Cates, unless if he has a terrible camp, is guaranteed to make the team with John Tortorella if he's playing like he did when he came up last year because, one, he's supposed to be a defensive first guy, and all of a sudden was like, yeah, don't worry, guys, I'm scoring. So, like, I feel like if he continues to do even the first thing he's supposed to do, which is defense, he only has to score 25 to 35 points, and John Tortorella's going to be happy because he's probably going to be in the third or fourth line. So as long as he's playing great defense, if he scores above 35 points, you're just getting a bonus at that point. So I think... Somebody like him fits perfectly in with Torch. And a guy that I think is going to be interesting a little bit, mostly because I didn't know this, but Williams, when I interviewed uh, Wiley for the Phantom, said that he Williams with the silver tips yelled a lot at times when he really had to get a point across. So it seems like if we have injuries to our defense and why Wiley's called upon, he might be like how Tortorella with Tampa and New York always had that random dude that just developed with John Tortorella. He could be that guy that, like, for us isn't random, but for the populace of hockey fans is random. That all of a sudden just develops under tour because it seems like he likes that style when he's kind of out of it and not in the right mode of being like, yo, get with it. Like, what the heck are you doing? And then, like, that snaps him right back into it. And then he's just doing his thing again. So it seems like Wiley's kind of a fan of that coaching style. So I feel like if he doesn't have the surprise Forster Bunneman making the team factor, 
he's at least going to have the like one of the first call ups if somebody gets injured. Yeah, yeah, I I, I love Noah Cates. By the way, I I think that you're right that he'll fit in really well. I think coming more directly from the college game, which has a different level of you know team first and discipline to it than the NHL does. I think that'll align really nicely with what Tortorella likes to do. And I think, you know, given that he's a little bit older because he finished out college, I think he just has the maturity to kind of fit in with some of the guys that are more veteran. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with that. I think Cates, he already, he didn't look phased where Brink still looked like he had some rollness to him where Cates kind of came in, like you said, as an overager and, didn't look phased at all even though Brink is a little bit older he still looked like he had a little bit more chomping ground to gain up and then Atard looked bad in the first six and then looked good in the last what was it seven or eight games so like he adjusted good in the end and I think that's he's going to be the most interesting guy to make the team potentially because his first half of games was not the best but to round out the season, he was actually pretty decent. So where's the organization? Do they think he needs AHL time? Or are they like, well, who cares? Just call him up because our defense isn't the sexiest anyway. And we might as well let him try to play to see what he can do. That's going to be the interesting thing to see, especially because he's right-handed. And the Flyers, obviously, other than Wiley, and then they brought in Brennan Manel if they do keep him, they don't have a, a plethora of ready to be in the league right-handed defenseman so that's going to be interesting to see what they do with that aspect but I think when it comes to now we can kind of move on to where we think and I think we touched on it a little bit but where we think the team is kind of in our mind compared to where like Tortorella we both agree is a guy that's a perfect hire for what the flyers are saying they want to do right but that's them making the perception trying to become reality thing where a lot of fans are not blind to the fact that john tortorelli even said himself when i was in columbus i really loved our compete level but we probably could have been pretty damn good if we had more skill well you look at the flyers roster and it's pretty reminiscent of that columbus roster like, okay, we have like five guys or four guys that have really good skill, and then everybody else is a very high compete level energy guy that's either great at defense or just great at offense. And it's like, okay, how do we balance all of that? So that's the thing that I think is going to be the most interesting for Torts because if they just decide to, where it seems like from reports they might be more aggressive this year, but I'm still in the realm of like 50 50 on that. Cause I don't want to get overhyped and think Chuck Plush is going to be aggressive and then be annoyed three months later when he didn't do anything. So it's more, I just kind of want to wait for it to play out and see, but looking at this team now, they're not a, in my mind, they're not a playoff team. No, they are most certainly not a playoff team. I think in some ways, this is a double-edged sword for Tortorella and for the team overall, because I think, the generally accepted attitude is that this is not a playoff team and that we cannot expect that out of them, except for the fact that management has this attitude that they can make a turnaround, that if they make the right moves in terms of free agency or trades or whatever Chuck Fletcher has planned. I mean, obviously, as of recording, we don't know what the outcome of all that will be yet. So there's another conversation to be had after that point. But I think that given what we know now, that if this team wanted to, they could play with house money and just say, let's try a bunch of creative things. Let's just throw expectations out the window and try to get the best out of our players that we have. Let's try and get our prospects to develop further and show concrete advancement on them in terms of their play, in terms of their productivity, you know, all of that and say, let's get small wins that aren't the big win and show progress here. And if they had that kind of attitude, the Flyers could have what we would all see as a successful season. Right. But I just don't think they will from the top down. That's the problem for me. 
Well, that's also what the team that just won the cup did, because Jared Bednar was a, their team was not good when he first came in. And then they brought the culture, they brought the mental side of it, which that's what I really like about Tortorella. He said in Columbus, he grew to not just be the Ruhaha guy on the physical side of what you have to be physically. He actually said, to, I think it was Aunt Santana. I can't remember what interview it was because I watched like every interview that John Tortorella put out with everybody in the population of Philadelphia. And all. But he talked about how he focuses more on the mental side now, unless his assistant coaches do everything else. And I thought that mm-hmm. was a very interesting take because that seems to be why a lot of people, even if they hate him during the time of him coaching them, as soon as they leave, they're like, you know what? He was right. I actually do need to work on that and I need to do X, Y. So like, it seems like, Everybody grows the light towards why I feel like from that aspect would be helpful because Joel, like there's certain guys like Joel Fabry doesn't need help with mentality. He came into the league and was immediately a stud and like say that's why he's similar to like how Jamie compared him to Ghani. I feel like that's not a decent that, that is a decent comparison. I mean, because both both of them kind of just came to the league and went about it like they did at every other level and didn't really seem like they were phased at any stretch of the imagination, even when they struggled, it didn't seem like they were phased. They were just going through a lull period, which is different than seeming like you just have no confidence. So I think there's certain guys that don't need that, but there's guys like Provorov that could probably use that a little bit. And it's going to be interesting. That's kind of the most interesting relationship for me that's going to be with Torsos. I know, I think Russ said Sanheim when I watched the podcast, where I feel like, because I agree with him wholeheartedly, like he's going to have to continue to um, improve defensively. But if he does more of what he did last year, and continues to improve on that. I think Sanheim will be fine because Sanheim, in my opinion, has a little bit more of accountability than Ivan Provorov. Where Ivan Provorov tends to blame everything but himself for the fact that something happened. And John Tortorella, that's like, for me, the biggest sin if John Tortorella is your coach. And we've seen that with Pierre-Luc Dubois and other examples in the past. So that's kind of why I worry about Provy because he's kind of is going to have to be more forthcoming in order to, I think, get along with Tort. Yeah, I, I think with Provorov, it's it's really interesting because to me, he's a guy that is very hard on himself and does hold himself accountable. I just think he's a guy that doesn't know how to talk about it in a way that makes it seem that way. I just look at his work ethic and extra time at the rink and how he trains, and I feel like he does have it in him to be, you know, the best he can possibly be physically. I think that he just kind of struggles with how to communicate that in some ways. And I I also think that he does have a little bit of that confidence issue that you were talking about in terms of needing a defensive partner, that he really is a guy that works the best in a partnership. He's not a a solo, like, I'm going to show off and do what I do kind of guy. He really wants to work as a team defensively. And um, I think that that's just something that if he's on your team, you have to adjust to. Um, so I give him a little bit more credit than than some people do. But I do. I don't think he's a perfect player. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but Yeah, like, I, I give I, him all the credit. I try to yeah. split it. Like, Russ kind of, I feel like Russ is actually the main reason why I matured in this way of splitting my thought process. Because he always talked about seeing both sides. Where I, when younger, always just saw one side. And then when I would have those conversations with Russ, I'm like, you know, that's a much better way to do it. Because <laughs> then you don't mm-hmm. get annoyed all the time. So, like, I feel like with Pro, like, so now, like, like that's why I figured out Russ is always nice and outgoing because he doesn't get annoyed or anything because he sees both well he does get annoyed and stuff but he doesn't get annoyed at as much stuff as i used to because yeah he, well, he sees both honestly, sides honestly he and he's he's very objective right he's not a exactly died in the wool flyers fan from childhood like i am honestly yeah yeah, yeah. like so i'm a dying it's wolf a little flyers different fan, but i'm also a hockey fan so i watch so yeah. much other hockey like, oh, I'm sure too. you do. Yeah, so yeah. you see other teams doing something perfect, and you'll be like, why? Why can't you? Like, this team's not even good. They're just playing at a high compete level to be 500. If you guys just did that, I would be happy because then we're building on something. 
So it's like, like if I looked at the Blackhawks, once Tourney took over, and I know people don't like complimenting the Blackhawks because of all the off-ice stuff, but it, you have to be honest from a hockey perspective, once Tourney took over, they actually did pretty darn well. They started doing better, Dylan Strom all of a sudden went back to being Dylan Strom, and you had other people that picked it up again, and the Tays came back and actually played really well when most of the media was saying Jonathan Tays was pretty much at the end and washed. So I think it all fits with the coaching. They're a team that I will always insult for what they did away from the ice, but that's because they deserve them. Both. But on the ice, they tended to always be, with the cup flipping the roster, one of the more competitive teams. And that's why I feel like I'm one of the minority with the Blackers that they'll be good again in two or three years because they just know how to figure it out with random people that you're like, oh, this guy's going to be decent. And then all of a sudden he's a 35 goal scorer. And you're like, oh, never mind. This guy's actually really good where the Flyers don't tend to get that as much. They got it with Matt Reed when they signed him for like two years before his lower body gave out. And they were able to get the good stuff from him. But we just, for some reason, whatever it is, I don't know what it is, are not able to necessarily pick those cream of the crop under the radar guys until recently with the Noah Cases and the Zamulas as good as, other teams have and that's kind of the end with Fedotov too in the seventh round so I like how Flair has built upon that becoming a better structure of our team because that's why I feel like I see part of why JJ and other people think this is going to be quicker than others because you're starting to pick guys that are actually developing really well from round four through seven which was not necessarily a strength of the Flyers other than when they just found a couple guys then so I think that really helps you going forward. But I think a big part of that is Brent Flair. And if Chuck does bad, is Brent Flair going to stay with the organization? I know I really do trust Danny, too, but is Danny ready to take that role? So it's more Flair's the draft he guy, Chuck's everything else. I don't want to lose Brent because I think Brent's actually done good at drafting. And I think that might actually be going back to a point made earlier, why Chuck Fletcher is still here. Because they're, they're going, well, I can't lose this guy. This guy actually has drafted well for us. Look what we got with Wisdom. Look what, like He's picking good in later rounds, too, with uh, Ethan Sampson. Maybe he's doing pretty good. We don't know if he'll be a good NHL player yet, but at least he's doing good at the levels much better than you would have expected. So Daniel Ye is lighting up everything he's ever touched. So I think you have that, and then Avon might end up becoming a steal of an undrafted kid. So I think he's the guy to do that. That's why I'm part of the people, and also on top of everything else, I you say your opinion on this, that thinks he should have been promoted if he wanted to stay. And then, like I said at the beginning, Briere should have been his assistant to grow under a guy that's obsessed with every level of hockey, whether it's Sweden, Finland, whatever, where Fletcher's more obsessed with the business side. Brent seems more like me, where we have one of those boxes that have all the jailbroken stuff on it, and I'll watch like the SHL, the KHL, the Finnish League, and leagues that I don't even understand what language you're speaking in. So I put it on mute just to be able to watch the, like, that's how obsessed I am with hockey. That's why I always make the joke to Russ. Like I couldn't marry anybody right now. Cause I would get divorced in three months because I've watched too much hockey. Unless if that person is also equally as obsessed with hockey as me, it wouldn't work. So <laughs> I, I feel like that's the big reason I resonate with flair more than Chuck. Cause I see the business side a lot. But I focus more on the player relations and what's going to help with that. And that's why I do like Torch admirably as a human being, because that's what he focuses on first and foremost. And it seems like that's what Flair focuses on first and foremost. Same with Danny B, where Chuck mainly just focuses on the business side. And that's why sometimes, even though I, I like him as a person, I think he's a wonderful human being, I question Chuck Fletcher. That's the only reason. I, I just think that he's really respected around the league in 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 hockey. And I'm not sure there's a way around that, given the culture of hockey overall, right? I mean, there's a reason why there's a coaching carousel and there's a GM carousel, right? That these guys get job after job. And in some ways, I understand it because the nature of the job is ultimately there is going to be failure and you need to reset, right? Right. But at the same time, like there has to be room for for new thought and, and creativity. And so, you know, I mean, my personal theory is that they're going to fail Chuck Fletcher up to a president role, kind of in the Paul Holmgren mold, and then 
at that point, maybe da- Danny Breer's ready, maybe he's not, but that's ultimately should they decide that Chuck Fletcher isn't like in the right space to do those deals to get the flyers in the right spot, but they really like him. They like his business sense. They like his temperament, fail him up to president happens all the time. That's actually a good point. Yeah. I didn't think about it as much from that perspective, but yeah, home group, that's a really good point because I saw it in rumors. And when I first saw it in rumors, I was like, I don't know about that. But then now that you put it that way, that makes a lot of sense to me because He's not going to be the direct guy making decisions. He's just going to be signing off on stuff. So I feel like I would be okay with either way at that point. But if that happened like this season, I would promote Brent and then let Danny B be his assistant because I feel like by December, if that's the case and you want to do that, I don't think Danny B, maybe he'll be ready. But perception wise, it seems like you should give him a little bit more time at the NHL level rather than him working with the NHL while still kind of managing Maine. To round out this season, which, by the way, beat Reading in the postseason. <laughs> but that's not here or there. Uh, so I think that's why I would give him a little bit more time. But either way, I like the people we have in house because of I never hated Chuck Fletcher as much as most of Philadelphia. Actually, I just was I, I just try to be what I should be about people. If I should be critical of them, I try to be critical. If I should be happy about them, I try to be happy. Like that's why I try to give him credit when he does do well. Like I thought that press conference was a good press conference because he was blunt. People disagreed with him, so that's why they hated it. But I thought he was very straightforward with Brett Flair in the press conference where I ended up disagreeing with a lot of people I know because I thought that was one of his better press conferences where most people don't think that. So I'm in the minority when it comes to that. But if he can speak like that all the time, and Flair becomes a GM of Bria, whatever hierarchy structure you do, I think all three of them can work well together. It's just I don't know if Chuck is in the right position, as you basically said as well, for himself right now. So if you have Chuck, then Flair, then Bria, I feel like that three-pronged structure would work perfectly, where right now it's just kind of a puzzle piece that's not perfectly put together. Yeah. I think that's fair. I, I just think that it's such a weird spot the Flyers are in right now. And it's kind of lose-lose for Chuck Fletcher. But, at, you know, at the same time, what's he going to do other than his job and try and make it work, right? And yeah. so I think he's kind of damned if he does and damned if he doesn't in terms of making big moves right now. Because that's the only way forward is to get the team to have a better record. But like I said, I feel like there's other ways to have a successful season here that are, I think, more uh, likable for fans. I think, you know, if if we get like a 35 goal scorer this season, like that would be a miracle, right? <laughs> so Yeah, like if you get Forsberg or Goudreau, no matter how the season rounds out, people are so, like, I understand like the whole perspective of you don't want to, be able to put on the book so you don't have room to get other guys. But if you're starting to develop guys better, like it seems like the Flyers are, hopefully you don't have to worry about paying anybody else $13 million. So, like, there's also that side of it because hopefully you're developing better that you're able to get those Fairby contracts or those Limblum contracts with mm-hmm. not just Fairby and Limblum, but other people that come up. So, I think that's the route the Flyers – like, personally, I think with their team, just because I – Love Johnny Goudreau to death. He's a local area product. I always love the kid. But when it comes to torch, unless if he plays like he did with Sutter and commits to defense like he did this year, from career track record, it seems like Philippe Forsberg would be the better signing for John Tortorella. But from what it seems like Goudreau might be now, which is just a freak of nature that produces over 100 points and is also at least solid, if not good at defense, that you would want more than... Forsberg, obviously, but it's a question of is that really Johnny Goudreau or is he able to just do that one year for Daryl Sutter on the defensive end? The offensive end, we know the dude's ridiculous. So that's more what I think the Flyers have to balance. Do you want to pay this dude 12 to 13 million bucks when he had one year he was great defensively and then other years he was mediocre and then Forsberg's been more of a two way guy his entire career, so, which is not going to be 13 million. It'll probably be like seven to nine. So you're also saving money. So I think. Yeah, that's I just, kind in of my opinion, I would rather have five 20 goal scorers on the team 
than one Johnny Goudreau in this upcoming season. I just, I, I think it's better in terms of your overall development. I think it makes your team better in the long run. And I think that's a better approach. Cause I think, you know, this past season, maybe we had two guys over 20 the whole season. It was like JVR and Cam Atkinson. And JVR got that by default too, because I know playing more by the end of the season. Yeah. It's like, that wasn't really a great 24 goal season. Maybe it right. was for JVR. Yeah. So if we get one 30 to 35 goal scorer and then four more guys above 20, that's that your production is already up. No, so I, agree. I think that's, that's a better I, approach. No, that's why, like, I've kind of said that in paid videos. I think the better approach to do that, I just kind of talk in what I think the team's going to do at this point because I'm like, well, why am I going to yeah. waste my time talking about what I would do because nobody cares? So, <laughs> like, where well, um, at a certain point, yeah, so like, it's no. more, um. I think the team's going to go big, but they really should sign the David Perrons of the world, the Phil Kessels of the world, because those guys bring into the room, even though Phil Kessel sucks at defense, uh, he still brings into the room fun, looseness, energeticness, and that's something the team needs desperately. And then you're getting David Perron also for the – you're getting two guys for the price of one, basically – and one's great both ways, and the other's probably going to score you, like you said, the 25 to 30 goals. Because even at this age, Phil Kessel's still going to score you if you put him in the right spot, 25 to 30 goals. And who knows? Maybe with John Tortorella, he'll be that random head coach that actually makes him – he's never going to be good defensively, but makes him at least adequate defensively so he's not a liability. So I think – Yeah, and I think the other thing that you get when you develop your players to – get them above that 20, 25 goal threshold is you get assets that are more attractive to other teams. And so in the following year, you're able to kind of offer more up in any potential trades or, or whatnot that you want to do to fill in the gaps where you are at that point. Right. So I think it helps you just take the right next step in order to set yourself up. And I know we always joke about, you know, oh, the Flyers are like two to three years away from being two to three years away. And yeah. you know, we all kind of roll our eyes at it. But when you when that's what the situation is, like, you got to do what that situation requires. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Where I think my biggest issue with the Flyers on if they're two or three years away or the six year structure is health. Because I think if Forster is able to stay healthy, Wade Allison's a very big question mark. I love Wade to mm-hmm. death, but like, if he's able to stay healthy, Linus also has to not go 155% every single time he skates on the ice, so he stays healthy. Because he honestly is a guy that I think could be the Bunneman and Trowinski to make the team off the bat. Because if you look at Sandine, he's a prototypical mm-hmm. Tortorella player. Oh, a guy that's good on both ends. If he has to, he could play center for you every now and again. He's not really a center, though, where that's pretty much what Tortorella loves. A guy that's just going to be high energy, compete at a high level. Like, basically, the Flyers still have Tyler Pitlick on their team. John Tortorella probably have a crush on Tyler Pitlick because he commits high level on both ends. Even if he makes a mistake, Torch seems to throughout his career not get mad at anybody that makes a mistake at a high compete level. It's more if you make a mistake being a lackadaisical, lazy person, then he's going to get mad at you because you didn't get in the right spot. If you got in the right spot and just didn't knock it down, he's not going to be happy you didn't knock it down, but he's also not going to get pissed at you in the process because you did everything right other than knock the puck down. So I think it's all just about with Torch's high compete level and – I think that's what I like about it. It's more, I actually, when it came to coaching, was thinking because I thought he was kind of wrongfully. Now, now don't, don't get me wrong. I don't want to ever question Stevie Y as a Hall of Famer in both assets, whether it's a running a team or playing the game of hockey. But I thought he did let him go a little bit soon, in my own opinion, just because he built that up for you to get to the growth of where to like, just because Zadina didn't develop. I think we blame coaches too much on guys not developing where it's more. Yes. Another coach might come in and put them in the right mentality, but on the flip side, why couldn't have he just put himself in the, so it's like, there's two sides of 
everything where like Zadina might do great with the new head coach, or he might still kind of be sputtering and just have to go to a new organization to do better. So it's like, I feel like he developed guys like Rasmussen, even though he didn't have the best stats, stats or stats. If you watch him on the ice, he started looking more physical, more as a bigger skater, like he was supposed to be. And not just a guy that was kind of there sometimes. And then you didn't even notice other times. So I like, he was more the guy when I was thinking like, I was with Russ because Russ invited me to that cool uh, Twitter group that you're all um, in for the hockey thing. That's really cool that you guys post different things about hockey in. And I, I agreed with him on that. Like, you got to the, fl- – the Flyers, I think the easiest way to put it on is the Flyers just overcomplicate things too much for me. Where, like, there's an easy road and then for some reason they try to take the road less traveled every single time. And I'm um, like – I love taking the road less travel, but not a hundred percent of the time. Like you have to, you have to also do other things, and that's why I like the Atkinson move and the Niskanen move. But the only time I would say they made moves that fit not into the road less travel category were pretty much those two. When it came to moves that Chuck Fletcher made, and then every other one was really, oh, let's hope Rasmus Ristolainen line becomes what Buffalo hope Rasmus Ristolainen line was supposed to be five years ago. So, like, those moves are a high risk. Hopefully with Torch, you can get the best out of Risto, but I would say at this point that's a decent if, if not a big if. Hello. You still here? Uh, it seems like, unfortunately, uh, Skype being Skype, uh, I can't hear Rachel right now. It seems like we might be having technical um, issues, but we also are at 42 minutes. So we did do a good long episode on the draft and the overall flyers for you. Um, oh, so we I'm definitely still here. have. Oh, there you go. Okay, you're still here. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear. I thought it broke out. So, no, what's your thoughts on. Um, that overall, because I feel like the Flyers, I noticed with Lappy too, that's why I didn't mind Lappy. Because also Lappy has a similar personality to me where he'll just screw around with you, just to screw around with you. So, like, we kind of, right. like, it's easy to get along with Lappy. Because uh, I have that hockey personality where, like, I will joke with somebody. And we know, like, it's out of love. Like, immediately, if you say something to somebody that's sarcastic as heck, you're not going to get mad at them because you know it's that hockey jabbing personality. And that's why I get a like i love working in hockey because i have that personality in general it's fun to joke with people like that where like when i unfortunately say something that somebody gets offended i'm like i was just joking man I'm like oh whoa, 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 whoa. like so it's like like i like having people that have that personality where in baseball which is stuff i tend to do other stuff with people are too chill sometimes where you're like okay well you can't really say anything to this person otherwise they're going to go off the rip like so it's kind of a different completely different aspect so i i do like hockey by far when i was growing up i liked baseball and hockey now hockey by far is surpassed baseball just because of how i matured and how my personality has become and rob manfred also isn't the best commissioner so he also hasn't made baseball the best where this is a random thing to bring up but just because i minus how he's dealt with scandals i actually thought other than stuff that he really shouldn't be the main guy to deal with because Gary Bittman doesn't know how to deal with sexual harassment scandals. There's supposed to be firms that deal with that. Uh, So like, I think I realized over time, I kind of blamed him more for that in the time. And now as I'm matured, I realize, well, a commissioner of a league shouldn't really have to deal with that. That's on the team that made him have to deal with that. And then that team plus the league, if I remember correctly, hired firms to that actually knew what they were talking about. And then that's how he made the verdict, if I remember correctly. It's not like he just said, okay, I'm just going to make this. So it's like, I think it was the wrong verdict. I completely agree with everybody that says that. It should have been harsher. But 
at the same time, you have to understand the business side of it. The Blackhawks are one of the most historic teams. And I think, unfortunately, you shouldn't have people get better bygone, so to speak, just because of that, like the Yankees do in baseball. But it happens. Like, that's just the way of the world, so to speak. Because I think Bettman, otherwise, other than scandals, has really grown the league internationally and has done a lot for the league where it seems like even in a few years we might play some games in Sweden or we might play some, which is going to be even better for the league. And they even want to start maybe that London branch or whatever, like like expand overseas. We might have to cancel out fighting at some point if we want to do that because of those rules over there. But there's at least stuff that they want to do. I don't agree with the canceling out fighting side because I really like that side. But at least you're expanding the league to get more revenue, which is in the end going to help the league as a whole. So I think the main objective he's had to obtain since he joined the league in nine, what was it, 94, 95, I think, maybe 92 as the commissioner. Yeah, it's been a while. That's for Yeah, sure. it's been a while. Yeah. Um, he's done decent with the main job he's supposed to have. He just hasn't done decent with – all the not even the secondary, but the third and fourth things he's supposed to do, which he's supposed to delegate more for, and sometimes he hasn't. So that's been, I think, what's nipped them in the butt. But overall, the main objective for your commissioner is to continue to grow the league and make the league more money. So he yeah. has done and that. And even unfortunately, to- that sometimes comes into conflict with some of the ethical issues that have popped up. <laughs> and so I think he's doing a terrible job on that front in terms of dealing with abuse and racism and homophobia and all of that stuff. I don't think he's doing a great job. No, but I don't think he's doing a good job. But that's job not, that. yeah, he, he's very focused on making money for the owners because they are his boss. Yeah, that's why I think if the league was smart, it shouldn't be led by Gary Bettman because he can't have his name on it. But it should be something he suggests for someone else to lead, have like a body of people that pay attention to that and regulate that and make sure that doesn't happen. Just like they have the body of people that make sure guys got tested for COVID and stuff, have a body of people that make sure none of that goes on in the locker room. And I think that will routinely help it over time. But the commissioner can't really be the guy to start that because of what you just said. So it's like the business side of it. He would need to tell somebody else. Like, I don't know, Brennan Shanahan is really respective in the community. And Brennan Shanahan will have to say, okay, cool. I think we should start this. And then everyone's going to just listen to Brennan Shanahan because he's Brennan Shanahan. And they're going to, well, not everybody, but most people will rally around somebody like Shanahan. So I think it's like he has to find the right guy to point that to. Where, unfortunately, like you said, because of the business and you can't completely condemn the Blackhawks because then nobody's going to pay attention to the Blackhawks and then you're losing money. So it's like you kind of said, other than diehard hockey fans are still like, like, I think diehard fans of a sport don't blame an overall team, like the players of the team, for that. Because it's, other than Patrick Kane and Taze, you might have known about stuff, but the current players of the team – for that like it's kind of like the same thing um with other teams around sports that have that kind of concur you can't really blame the roster players that are there now you have to blame the organization's hierarchy for allowing that to happen because like dylan strome for example wasn't on the blackhawks when that happened so it's not like you should stop watching dylan strome just because so it's more there's a two-way street to everything because if you want to support a guy like i not just because Matt came here, but I always thought the Strong family was one of the more criticized families in hockey for no reason. Because just because you take longer to develop doesn't mean you suck. It just means simply that you just took longer to develop than Patrick Kane. Which happens just, with some guys. It just does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's why I get annoyed at some of the community that's overly negative at times because I'm like, Look at what he did again when he got a new head coach. So it just proves he's talented offensively. Now he always has to work on is a little bit better skating. Dylan Strom, I'm talking about. And uh, defense. Matt has to work on skating. And that's pretty much it. Other than that, I've actually really liked what I saw of Matthew Strom this year. Minus the fact that he still has to work on skating a little bit. And then Ryan's Ryan. If Ryan Strom came in the Flyers, I would do a freaking backflip because I think he would fit in perfectly with John Tortorella. So yeah. I think that's a I, pipe dream, that, but it's a good, it's a good thought. It's <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a good thought, but like, yeah, like he would be a guy, if we paid him seven, five, 
I would much like I, I would be happy with paying him seven five because he's fast on both ends. He's good in the face off guy. He's a very good anticipator. Even if he only scores you fifty five points, forget the fact that he just scored fifty five points. He did seventy five other things. So it's like he's one of those guys, which is what I kind of see in the growth of Dylan. And you're seeing it slowly. Like Matt's probably one of those guys that might get caught up at like twenty six, but then when he gets called up. He's probably going to be so great at the fundamentals of the ins and outs that he might be a pretty decent fourth liner, like how Nate Thompson got consistently up in his mid to mid, yeah, it was mid mid twenties, I think. Like he might be a guy that profiles that. Where I know hockey Flyers fans don't love the name Nate Thompson from how he ended his career here, but throughout his career earlier, he was a pretty darn good guy for being a guy that was lost by the wayside by most scouts. So. I feel like Strom, Matthew Strom could profile to that, but that's why he's not going to be probably up for another year or so because he started in Reading, went to Lehigh, did really good this year. I would think next year they would want him to play a whole season in Lehigh and then kind of go from there, and that's kind of the track record. We just saw with the Phillies, I don't know how much of a crossover Phillies fan you are, Rachel, but Derek Hall, like every other first baseman for the Phillies, it seemed, got caught up at 26. Where Ryan Howard got caught up at 26 after Jim Tomey. It seems like for some reason the Phillies just consistently call a first baseman at 26, unless if you're Reese Hoskins, who I think got caught up like one year before that. So it's an interesting feat for the Philly teams, but I think it's smart because some guys you can rush up. They're ready. Other guys you have to have the patience as a virtue. And I've liked since Hextall's come in, that's the one thing I will critique Hextall for other thing. But the system he's brought in to scout and stuff that Flair's even admitted to kind of continuing and just expanding on, that side of things really helped the organization. The hard-headed side of Ron Hextall didn't. But that side of things really helped the organization that I think that's why, excuse me, Flair is able to expand upon an already good system where if Hextall wasn't here, we would have still had the old-school 90s system that involved no new age stats, and you would have Brett Flair coming in like, what the heck is this? So I think he definitely did help in that aspect, at least. Yeah, I think so. I I just think that it it's a weird year, and it's like they're going to have to pick and choose where they make progress and where they don't. And um, I think developing players is going to be a huge part of that and making sure that they are ready. Yeah, I completely agree with that. An interesting player before we go that I'm interested in your thoughts on, because I tend to be a little bit higher on him than most of Philly, and that's because from especially the one interview we went to, the dude was eating through a stroll for a week straight and still playing hockey. Um, I think Morgan Frost is going to be better than some people give him credit for over time. I think he's just a slow developer. And now that we have Tippett, that kind of made more sense to me two months later because like when that trade happened at first i'm like eh. like i don't mind it i like going tip it but like for claude and Giroux to begin and then when i kind of puzzle pieced everything and i'm like wait a minute they both played on the same junior so like you were like they got some like they actually started doing what other teams do and don't just focus on the utmost skill all the time focus on connectivity of a roster as well which is what really won the eagles a super bowl first and foremost, in my own opinion. And then on, then then it was the skill. I think you have to have that connectivity, and I think the Flyers focusing on that more now hopefully continues because if I'm them, don't overcomplicate things. I don't think Morgan Frost should be a center. You might want to switch Noah Cates and Morgan Frost because I think Noah Cates might be a better center. But besides that, you should keep – that line together, in my own opinion, because they played so great last year and they're a bunch of young guys. If they continue to work well, well, then you have what the Rangers had, where you have that thing that's uh, nicknamed the kid line. And there's that there's nothing wrong with that. So I think they should be smart about it. Like we've been saying this whole podcast, which I'm glad because other people um, I've had on, we talked about that, but we didn't go into it as deep on this podcast. So I'm glad uh, we were able to go into that deeper on this podcast. You have to let guys not just develop, but you have to let guys develop at their own rate and be themselves. And I think with Torts and I think um, with Flair now, but mainly Danny Breer, because he involved the development staff like he did with Maine as much as possible at the minor league level, that's going to continue to grow 
and I think you're going to see the Flyers have more Max Wilmans and more Hayden Hodgson's too, that yes, they might not be. Well, Hodgson, I think, might have a better chance just because of the other side of his game, but they might not be the consistent NHL player, but the depth guys that develop from the ECHL, the system they have in place is probably going to help with that. Like Mason Millman, I think, eventually is probably going to make his NHL debut. If he sticks in the NHL, is a completely different story. But I think he'll eventually make it. And he started with, well, he started with Leon because of the pandemic. And then he really played most of his time with Reading. I think they're starting to do things in the way that makes more sense. It's just a lot of people of our fan base also, like that's the only reason I go back and forth people on YouTube, or not YouTube, more on Facebook, Twitter sometimes is you have people that insult an article you wrote about a fandom and then you're asking them if they watch the fandoms and they never watch one game in their entire life. So, like, you kind of get to the point of, like, well, right. how are you I mean, supposed to judge? I've, I've watched <laughs> almost every Phantoms game for the past three years, at least. Yeah, yeah. Heard. Like, I got AHL. So. I tried to go to as much as possible before. And then once AHL TV came out, I grabbed because I'm not in an area that has service electric. So I grabbed the uh, AHL TV and then I watched them there. And even for the Royals, I watch. Even the away games that I don't have to do anything for for working for them, I do I watch on the flow hockey, which is the most expensive, oddly enough, of all the uh things you subscribe to for hockey, just because flow hockey's not just hockey, it has like Quidditch on it and like cricket and all these things you would never watch. But they're on there, so they charge you for everything. Where honestly NHL TV and HL TV was cheaper than Flow Hockey, which is the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. But I still get it just because I want to watch all the games. So it's not really at that point. You're like, I want to enjoy watching the games. I'm going to pay what it is. And that's one of the few things in life. You're just going to pay what it is basically. But Yeah. I, I just, I think, you know, kind of going back to development and the phantoms and, and Morgan Frost, I think that Morgan Frost has been a, a slower ride in terms of, development but i do think there's a lot of potential there and it would be a shame if they gave up on him yeah that's exactly how i think i do think he he's got better in the face-off dot but so did like g was good oh yeah 100 percent. that doesn't that it. doesn't mean you can't move him to wing and just let him do what g did and then whenever you need a face-off let him play center some because i feel like defensively noah cates is a little bit more of a profiled center where offensively Frost could do whatever you want, but defensively not so much. So that's kind of the difference there. Yeah, I, I think you're right uh, on that count, that Morgan Frost, I think, could play wing but take face-offs. And um, I think that would be a really good position for him. Yeah, because I think that makes and I think Torch is going to think of that right off the bat, to be honest. I think it was more – it wasn't anything against Mike Yo. It was more this last season was just a crapshoot – that AV got fired, Yo comes in and then kind of just said to get the room back as much as possible, be you. And he didn't really, I, like, he had a system, but, like, I think his system was more what Joe Madden does in baseball, and it's more like, here's the two to three things I want you to do, otherwise do whatever the hell you want to do, and if you do good, I'm happy. Like, and, and that's different than most, where Tortorella is going to be a lot more structured, but at the same time, if you're doing great, John Tortorella is not a coach that cares if you're partying with Khloe Kardashian for 75 hours straight. As long as you come to the game and score seven like points in 10 days and you're doing well still, he's going to tell you you're an idiot for doing that, obviously, but he's not going to care in the end. So it's like he's a guy that's a little bit different where he's, I think, going to wipe away that old schoolness of the Flyers where, like, let's be honest. I, I think people that say a big reason we didn't trade Richard and Carter for because, was not because of their off-the-ice antics, I think that's a lot. <laughs> like, personally, <laughs> I think the main reason we traded Richie and Carter, because if you look at the numbers, why else are you trading them? Mike Richards might have not been the best player, but he was a good captain. Jeff Carter was a guy that you didn't have anybody else for. He was just a pure sniper. So it wouldn't have made any sense otherwise. And I think they got too bogged down in culture then, like the Bruins do sometimes, and then moved them. And you're like, okay, 
So, like, one of those trades ended up working out. The other worked out decently because we ended up doing that domino effect of trades with Brayton Shen and everything. But to me, I think I just like per- personally, hopefully, how the team's going with Tortorella. The last thing for me is how I'm going to like it with Tortorella is who do we hire as the last assistant coach since we brought back Daryl and they kept the uh, Delba, which I thought was the right decision. Who's going to be that guy that Torch admitted to being the guy that's going to help him on the power play since that's one of his few uh, weaknesses. So, like, that's going to be the interesting thing where my first guy I thought of was, even though he was with Haxel and Haxel didn't work, I think you might even mention this before, too. No block kind of makes sense because he got a compliment. When you get a compliment from a guy that's nicknamed Mick Jesus, about how good you are running an offense, I think that should hold some weight. So, like, there's a – I think he knows what he's doing when it comes to running a power play. I just don't think he's fully ready to be a head coach yet. And that's what kind of showed in Harford when they were great at the beginning of the season and then just claps flat on their face at the end of the season. So I think he could be a good power play coach, though. Yeah, I, I think that – it's uh, there's just so many – factors here it, it's hard to predict anything but i do think that torts is going to be a benefit to some of the guys right now yeah i do think so too i think it's going to be interesting as my closing point um to see who benefits the most and who ends up being the because it's probably going to be with the way let's face it this team is one PLD in this situation that turns into the guy that has to be traded just because he doesn't work with. Like, you don't want that to happen, but it seems like reality, that's going to happen with at least one person, that they're just not going to fit into the torch system. And they're going to be moved, and you're going to get something back for them like they did with PLD, but, like, they're just going to end up being moved. But we do thank you all for joining us. I really thank Rachel for joining Uh you can check her out on Locked on Flyers. And then, Rachel, I'll turn it over for you to see if you have any other things that you want to share as well. No, just uh, thanks for this. This was a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, you can listen to myself and Russ Cohen over on Locked on Flyers. And that is our Twitter handle as well. Yep. Yeah, I would definitely check that out. The crossover episodes they did are cool, too. That's cool how you guys sort of doing with all the different Locked ones, those crossover episodes, whether it's talking about the draft or just talking about the team uh, in general. But for me, you can follow here to continue to subscribe at Sports Fanatic News and also please continue to subscribe for the new podcast. Steel Peeler and I started doing new ish now since it's about a month and a half old uh, for the old genre music fest uh, podcast as well. But stay safe, everybody. Be careful out there. Stay safe and enjoy your soon to be weekend as we're at Thursday at the time of recording. Um, and tomorrow is going to be the TGIF day where everybody's celebrating once five o'clock hits for the most part. But peace out, everybody. Stay safe and enjoy your weekend.